Welcome everyone to the 12th Carbon webinar and the final webinar for 2021. My name is Nigel Marks and on behalf of the Australian Carbon Society and Curtin University, we are, we're delighted to be online once again with our carbon colleagues around the world. For those in the Americas, good morning. And for colleagues in Europe and elsewhere, good afternoon. And for those in Australia and Asia, good evening. I'd like to remind everyone that the session is recorded and will be available on YouTube afterwards. And as always, links to YouTube are available are available on the hashtag carbon webinar website. So before we begin, uh, we have some prizes to announce for the carbon webinar poster session held one month ago. So in the student section, the runner up is uh, Pei Lei Yap, whose topic was detecting carbonaceous counterfeits in graphene. So congratulations, Pei Lei. And the winner in the student section is Daniela Silva, whose topic was carbon nanotubes for neural tissue growth. Congratu congratulations, Daniela. Both winners will have the opportunity to present a short talk in a 2022 carbon webinar. Our next prize category is for early to mid-career researchers. In the EMCR category, the runner-up is Natalia Garcia, whose topic was a software approach to create graphene oxide tilings. Congratulations, Natalia. And the winner in the EMCR category is Andrea Barazun Aravina, whose topic was quantum chemistry for gas reaction studies on zigzag and armchair sites. Congratulations, Andrea. The two EMCR winners will also present a short talk next year, so we can look forward to those presentations too. Now, just a few words before we begin our presentation this evening. As always, there will be a question and answer session after the presentation. To ask a question, please type it into the Zoom chat box indicated by the graphic on screen, and feel free to type your questions during the webinar. There's no need to wait until we're done. After the presentation, I will read out the submitted questions and our speaker will have a chance to respond. And once the formalities of the webinar are concluded, I encourage you to stay around a little bit longer for an informal video chat using the online platform called GatherTown. It's a very nice way uh, to finish off our carbon webinar series for the year. So with that out of the way, it's uh, now time to introduce our speaker. I'm delighted to introduce tonight Professor Yasuhiro Yamada from Chiba University in Japan. Professor Yamada received his PhD in 2008 from the University at Buffalo, part of the State University of New York. Following his PhD, he returned to Japan, working at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology and Nippon Chemicon Corporation. A year later, in 2009, he was appointed assistant professor at Chiba University where, he's been, where he has been conducting detailed computational analyses of carbon materials to establish the fundamentals of defects. And this is what he's going to talk about tonight. Professor Yamada received the Research Encouragement Prize in 2014 from the Carbon Society of Japan and the Brian Kelly Award in 2016 from the British Carbon Group. Today, he will be speaking on the topic, detecting and controlling defects in carbon materials. Professor Yamada has kindly recorded his presentation, but is watching online and will be available for questions afterwards. Thank you for joining us, Professor Yamada, and we look forward to your presentation. I appreciate Australian Carbon Society and committee members of Carbon Webinar for inviting me at Carbon Webinar. I'm glad to be here today. I'm Yasuhiro Yamada from Chiba University in Japan. The title of today's talk is Detecting and Controlling Defects in Carbon Materials. In the beginning, let me explain about myself. Since 1999, I have started studying carbon materials. I studied preparation of porous material for electrical double layer capacitors and fuel cells at National Institute of Technology, Bunma College, and Hiroshima University in Japan. I studied thermal interface materials and three dimensional microstructuring of carbon materials attached to substrates and received PhD from University of Buffalo, the State University of New York in the USA. After that, I studied carbon nanotube electrodes for electrical double layer capacitors at 
National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology and Nippon Chemical Corporation in Japan. Through various researches about preparation and application of carbon materials, I realized the importance of building the foundation of carbon materials. Since I became an assistant professor at Chiba University in Japan, I have been conducting, detecting defects and controlling defects in carbon materials. As an editor of Tanso, let me introduce the new journal about carbon materials. The Carbon Society of Japan will start publishing the new journal, Carbon Reports. The first issue will be published in March 2022. It is open access and free of charge for article processing for several years, so please submit papers to Carbon Reports. For more information, you can send an email to addresses at the bottom of this page. Now let's move back to today's topic. I will talk about two main topics. One is detecting defects in carbon material. Using spectroscopies and calculation of carbonization reaction pathways. The other is controlling defects in carbon materials. The first topic is detecting defects in carbon materials. Carbon materials contain various defects such as edges, pentagons, heptagons, vacancies, and functional group in addition to the impurities. It is easy to obtain experimental spectra such as IR, Raman, XPS, and NMR. However, spectral analysis reduces the information of the structures because the peak, peaks of similar bonding states generally appear very close to each other, causing difficulty to differentiate the difference of structures. The reduced information of structures prevents us from estimating accurate structure of carbon materials. Therefore, multiple analysis, such as experimental and calculated spectroscopy and carbonization reaction pathways, are essential to clarify defect structures. This figure shows the concept of our analysis of defects in carbon materials. Generally, most researchers conduct experiments and assign peak position obtained from references. Those assignments were generally conducted using limited information, causing the ambiguity of the assignments. Therefore, my group has spent an enormous amount of time estimating the actual structure of carbon materials by calculating carbonization reaction pathways in addition to calculated spectra. This is an example of our detailed analysis of carbon materials. As the first step, we obtain carbonized structure of one precursor using molecular dynamics simulation with reactive force field. As a second step, we calculate various spectra such as IR. As the last step, we estimate the structure of defects by comparing calculated spectra with experimental spectra. Now let me explain in more detail about analysis of carbon materials using experimental and calculated XPS spectra. This is an example of a comparison between general assignments and our assignments for C1S XPS spectra. Most groups assign C1S XPS spectra into mainly four peaks, such as sp2 carbon and sp3 carbon and CO and COO. On the other hand, my group can assign much more precisely Although a combination of combustion elemental analysis and a calculated XPS spectra is essential because of the difficulty to obtain accurate peak position of sp2 carbon, we assign the C1S using the result of combustion elemental analysis and calculated peak position of CC 
and CH and CO and CN. The other example of a comparison between general assignments and our assignments is N1S XPS spectra. Many groups generally do not consider full width at half maximum, FWHM. Some group may assign this N1S spectrum as 100% pyridinic nitrogen, although the FWHM is too broad. On the other hand, my group takes into consideration of the minimum FWHM obtained from the XPS device, and the same spectrum is assigned as 50% pyridinic nitrogen in my group. Now, I will explain briefly how to calculate XPS spectra. First, structures are constructed, and orbital energy of structure were calculated using Gaussian 0, 09 and 16. By applying either asymmetric or symmetric box function depending on the a conductivity and photoionization cross-section for each peak, we can obtain calculated XPS spectra whose peak position and peak area are close to experimental ones. The most important part is that we apply the FWHM of graphite as minimum FWHM of the calculated spectra. For example, the area of carbon atoms bonded with four pyridinic nitrogen atoms should be twice the area of the carbon atom bonded with four primary amines because the number of carbon atoms bonded to the nitrogen becomes double. In order to validate the reliability of calculation, calculated and experimental XPS spectra are shown here. Eight reference compounds were compared. From the structures of A to F, the calculated peak positions and peak area are close to the experimental ones. So the reliability of the calculation was confirmed. The experimental peak area of bottom two spectra are much smaller than the calculated ones. It is possibly because of the instability, low purity, or charge up effects of raw material. Now, let me explain the problems of XPS analysis one by one, although I cannot explain everything today because of the limited time. There are many problems with reported assignment of XPS for carbon materials. However, today, I will explain main problems of C1S and N1S XPS spectra. The first problem is the peak position of SP3 versus SP2. The C1S peak position of SP3 carbon is generally reported to be higher in energy than that in SP2. However, Please check the range of the error of the peak position of SP2 and SP3. The, the error of the peak position of graphite is only plus minus 0.2 electron volt, whereas that of diamond is 2.0 electron volt. Ninety-nine percent of research papers explain that the peak position of SP3 carbon is higher than that of SP2 carbon, although less than 1% of research papers explain that the position is opposite. Thus, most researchers would believe that the peak position of SP3 carbon should be higher than that of SP2 carbon. However, our calculation showed that the peak position of SP3 was lower than that of SP2 carbon. 
in order to determine the origin of the peak position of sp3 carbon, diamond crystals were embedded in graphite, which is HOPG. This is the top view of diamond on HOPG. This is the side view. Some of the diamonds were just loaded on the HOPG, but not embedded inside HOPG, as you can see peak 4. Some of the diamonds were loaded on top of diamonds, as shown in SEM images. As the amount of diamonds on the HOPG increased, more and more diamonds were charged up because diamonds are overlapped with each other. The charge up effect was also observed as white diamond crystals in SEM images. Less charged up diamonds which were embedded in HOPG are gray. C1S XPS spectra of HOPG and diamond on HOPG at different amounts are shown next to SEM images. The bottom spectrum is spectrum of HOPG without diamond. The second from the bottom is a small amount of diamonds embedded in HOPG. The peaks of peak 2 to 6 were obtained from the different spectra from the spectra of HOPG. As the amount of diamond increase from here to here, the peaks at 285 to 290 electron volts appeared. The peak position of peak 2 was almost the same as the peak of HOPG. It means that peak position of SP3 carbon without charging effect should be almost the same as that of SP2, or the peak position of SP3 carbon could be lower than that of SP2 carbon. The peak position of sp2 and sp3 carbon were calculated using the model, model compounds that contain diamond-like structure bonded with small graphene-like structures. The calculated peak positions of diamond-like structures were consistently lower than those of graphene-like structure. Thus, it is expected that experimental peak position of sp3 carbons without charge up effect should be lower than that of sp2 carbon. The next problem is the presence of heptagons and pentagons. Structures of graphene with pentagons are shown here. As the number of pentagons increased from 2 to 6 from left to right, the peak originating from CC bond of pentagons increase and the FWHM of total C1S spectra also increased. It is because the peak position of CC of hexagon are higher than those of pentagons. Comparing the peak position of CC of hexagons, the peak position of SP2CH are minus 0 0.1 to minus 0 0.4 electron volt lower and those of CC of pentagon are 0 0.3 to minus 0 0.7 electron volt lower than those of CC of hexagon. The figure on the right hand side shows the change of FWHMs depending on the number of pentagons in graphene. As the number of pentagons increase from 0 to 6, FWHM of C1S spectra increased from 1.2 to 1.4 electron volt. A further increment of pentagons from 6 to 12 decreased the FWHMs because the number of bonding states becomes small 
and the number of polling states ensuring is 1. Similar to pentagons, heptagon also shows a peak shift from hexagons. However, the peak position of CC bonds of heptagon is higher than that of hexagons. So the direction of the shift for the peak position of CC bonding of heptagon is opposite to that of pentagons. Using this calculation method of C1X XPS spectra, we attempted to quantify the percentage of pentagons using experimental spectra. These regions were placed in glass tubes under reduced pressure. An ample tube were carbonized. The carbonized sample in the ample tubes were analyzed. The left hand side is C1S spectra of Coronavirus, which contains one pentagon surrounded by five hexagons. And the coronavirus carbonized at 823 Kelvin to 873 Kelvin. The right hand side is C1S spectra of fluoranthin which contains one pentagon surrounded by three hexagons and the fluoranthine carbonized at 903 Kelvin and 923 Kelvin. The calculated peak position of pentagon shown as a pink line in coronarium was shifted clearly to the lower binding energy of 283.4 electron volts compared to the hexagon because the pentagon are surrounded by five hexagons. Therefore, it is possible to quantify the percentage of pentagons in carbonized coronavirus. For the precise analysis of C1S XPS spectra, the percentage of hydrogen and carbon obtained from combustion elemental analysis are essential because the peak position of CC in hexagon is not clear enough. From the percentage of combustion elemental analysis, the percentage of CH and uh, CC in C1S XPS spectra can be obtained and the peak position of CC can be fixed so that we can obtain the percentage of pentagon. From the explained results and other results that I did not explain everything today, the reported peak as sp3 carbon is possibly not related to sp3 carbon but related to heptagon or point defect or CC bond influenced by functional groups. The next problem is the assignment of CN bonding. Many papers about nitrogen containing carbon materials do not explain the CN bonds in the C1S spectrum. Instead, CO bonds are explained. In this table, the peak position of sp 2 cn and sp3cn were cited from two references. However, the peak position of sp2cn and sp3cn seems to be almost the same. This table lists the peak positions of various CN bonding shifted from CC bonding. Except for number one, peak position of CN bonding can be distinguished from that of CC bonding. These results are just example of the peak position of CN bonding. I will explain later as a result of this second paper published in 2021, but the edge structures and the degree of carbonization also affect the peak positions. So obtaining the peak positions based on precursor structure and the degree of carbonization is suggested. The next problem is about N1S XPS spectra similar to 
C1S XPS spectra, the assignments of N1S XPS spectra also have many problems. The definition of graphitic nitrogen is unclear. Many researchers write as quaternary nitrogen, but it seems that quaternary nitrogen means graphitic nitrogen. Only some researchers write tertiary nitrogen as the nitrogen in the base of brain. In addition, the assignment of pyroric nitrogen also causes ambiguity. Most researchers assign the peak at 399.4 to 400 electron volt as pyroic nitrogen. However, as a result of our calculation, tertiary nitrogen is also possible functional group in that region. In order to reveal the origin of graphitic nitrogen and pyroric nitrogen, we calculated graphene nanoribbon with different degree of carbonization. The bottom structure contains tertiary nitrogen without any surrounding benzene ring, which we call T0. The second structure from the bottom contains tertiary nitrogen with one surrounding benzene ring, which we call T1. The top structure contains tertiary nitrogen with three surrounding benzene rings, and this structure is so-called graphitic nitrogen, but no cation on nitrogen, which we call T3. In general, as the degree of carbonization increase, more benzene rings develop. Thus, the change of the peak position from 0 to 3 can be used to analyze the degrees of carbonization. These are the calculated C1S and N1S XPS spectra of graphene and ribbon with tertiary nitrogen. As the number of benzene rings surrounding tertiary nitrogen increase, the peak position of CN bonding in C1S and tertiary nitrogen in N1S increase. Therefore, the peak shift during carbonization is related to the degree of carbonization. Similar to tertiary nitrogen, peak position of secondary nitrogen is also influenced by the degree of carbonization. Second Delhi nitrogen is named as S. 1P stands for 1 pentagon, so S1P means pyroic nitrogen. As the number of benzene rings surrounding secondary nitrogen increase, the peak position of CN bonding in C1S and secondary nitrogen in N1S increased. We further compare the influence of edges on the peak position. The left hand side is graphene nanoribbons with armchair edges, and the right hand side is graphene nanoribbons with zigzag edges. Peak positions of tertiary nitrogen on graphene nanoribbon with zigzag edge were higher than those with armchair edges. The calculated peak position of tertiary nitrogen, T3, were 400.3 to 401.3 electron volts. On the other hand, the reported peak positions of quaternary nitrogen, QN, were 400.6 to 402.2 electron volts. It means that peak position of T3 and QN are close to each other. By comparing calculated tertiary nitrogen and calculated quaternary nitrogen in this work, peak positions of tertiary nitrogen and quaternary nitrogen are again close to each other. 
Therefore, it is possible that reported quaternary nitrogen in many references is tertiary nitrogen instead. By comparing the peak positions of pyloric nitrogen from references and calculation in this work, and those of tertiary nitrogen of graphene and olivon with armature edges, peak positions are close to each other. Therefore, the reported pyloric nitrogen in many references is possibly tertiary nitrogen T1, T2, and T1P instead if NH bonding is absent. In order to confirm the presence of tertiary nitrogen in carbon materials, we use polyimide. Polyimide was heated up to 3173 Kelvin. The percentage of hydrogen and oxygen becomes almost zero at 1873 Kelvin. So by using the material at this temperature peak position of N1S, XPS spectra without the influence of edges and oxygen can be obtained. Left hand side is the experimental N1S XPS spectra and right hand side is the calculated XPS spectra. The bottom one is spectrum of polyimide and the spectra above the spectra spectrum are spectra of heat treated polyimide. At 800, 1873 Kelvin, the peak was observed at 401.2 electron volts. As a result of calculation, the peak at 400.6 originates from tertiary nitrogen in hexagons, and the peak at 401.6 electron volt originates from tertiary nitrogen in heptagons. Thus, the experimental peak at 401.2 electron volt observed in the sample carbonized at 1873 Kelvin should be related to tertiary nitrogen in heptagons. We also observed the experimental peak at 400.1 electron volts. In general, the experimental peak around 400 electron volts is assigned as pyloric nitrogen, but the sample in this work does not contain any hydrogen. It means that the peak is not originated from pyrolytic nitrogen. The calculated peak position of tertiary nitrogen on pentagon show the peak at 400.1 electron volt. Thus, the experimental peak at 400.1 electron volt related to tertiary nitrogen on pentagon. We further compare the total electron energy of quaternary nitrogen and tertiary nitrogen. The energy of graphene with quaternary nitrogen was much higher than that of tertiary nitrogen. On the other hand, the energy of graphene with pentagon and heptagon was a little bit larger than that of graphene with tertiary nitrogen. It means that the presence of pentagon and heptagons is possible, but for the probability of the presence of quaternary nitrogen is low. Therefore, the quaternary nitrogen in many reported papers is probably tertiary nitrogen. As a short summary of N1S XPS spectra, graphitic nitrogen means tertiary nitrogen if there is no counter anion. Reported pyloric nitrogen is probably tertiary nitrogen in the absence of NH group. As the degree of carbonization becomes high, the peak position of tertiary nitrogen becomes high. Also, the peak position of tertiary nitrogen were influenced by type of edge structures. The peak position of tertiary nitrogen in graphene nanoribbons with zigzag edge edges were higher than those with armature edges. 
These are our publication related to XPS analysis of carbon material with sp 3 carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen containing functional group. And also pentagons, heptagons, edges, nitrogen, metal ion, coordinated carbon material. If you are interested, please read especially the recommended ones. The next analysis is IR. IR is generally used for analyzing functional groups. However, only a few researchers know that IR is a great tool to analyze the edge structures of carbon material. In addition, IR spectra contain information to analyze the degree of carbonization because of the similarity with Raman spectra. Problems of IR analysis are mainly divided into two problems such as limited number of references and the undeveloped region of 1000 to 1800 cm inverse. The importance of IR has been reported by several groups, but let me explain the importance briefly, especially the region between 700 to 950 cm inverse is the essential region for analyzing the, the edge structure of carbon materials. For example, solo means that one CH group is present in one benzene ring and similar to zigzag edges. It is out of plane bending vibration. The definition of solo is similar to zigzag edges. But solo is different from zigzag edges for some edges. The peak positions are displayed here, but the positions may change depending on the presence of hetero atoms or sp3c. Duo means that two CH groups are present in one benzene ring. Duo is similar to armature edges, but different from armature edges for some edges. In plain CH stretching vibration of zigzag edges and armature edges can be observed, but it is limited to carbon materials with plenty of hydrogen. Unlike outer plane CH bending vibration, the intensity of in plane CH stretching vibration is very weak. For carbon materials with plenty of hydrogen, it is possible to estimate the percentage of zigzag and armature edges by comparing CH bending and stretching vibration. It is essential to obtain the percentage of edges after heat treatment. Thus, we obtain the percentage of solo from this equation. By comparing the, the area percentage of solo before and after heat treatment, the percentage of, of the remained solo were obtained. The importance of IR can be seen in this figure. These figures are tetracene and tetracene heated from 653 to 933 Kelvin. In general, analysis of, the le of this region of IR is neglected. But as you can see, IR spectra have G-band-like peak and D-band-like peaks in a similar way to Raman spectra. The information of the experimental IR spectra can be extracted using calibrated IR spectra and molecular dynamic simulation, EXFF. Especially for analyzing pentagons in carbon materials, Raman spectra are well used. However, IR also has similar information of pentagon at similar peak position. The top spectra are experimental spectra of coranurin and heat-treated coranurin. Coranurin contains one pentagon in the middle of five hexagons. The similarity between IR and Raman spectra 
was also observed in the spectra of Coranuran. In IR spectra, G band like peak were observed, and the Pentagon detected peak were also observed, similar to Raman spectra. As a short summary of IR, percentage of edges in carbon materials can be obtained from CH vibration. The region of 1000 to 1800 cm inverse contains precious information for analyzing defects in carbon material. It is not explained today, but this region is especially useful nitrogen containing carbon material according to our recent research. These are our publications related to IR. If you are interested, please read, especially the recommended ones. Using spectroscopies and the calculation of spectra, we can estimate the defects much more precisely and accurately than before. However, as I explained, the information of on the spectroscopy is not enough. Therefore, the reaction pathways are essential. To estimate the reaction pathways such as carbonization, oxidation, and stability, and so forth, my group uses molecular dynamic simulation with reactive force field, FF, in addition, transition state calculation, formation energy calculation are used. Mainly two types of software, such as FF and Gaussian, have been used. Both methods have advantages and disadvantages. Currently, my group uses EXFF because of the short calculation time to unveil the reaction pathways. This is an example of the EXFF raw material such as tetracine. In this case, are heated using EXFF and spectra of reactive structure were obtained. By comparing experimental spectra and calculated spectra, we can estimate the carbonized structure of tetracene. Colonulene, which contains five member ring and one pentagon, and fluorine were also heated to estimate carbonized structure. The XFF can be utilized to screen the raw materials for carbon materials with solo which is similar to zips of edges. To make use of research time and research funding efficiently, developing screen techniques of raw material is necessary. Three raw materials were used to compare how many solos were left after heat treatment. The result of X and Lyax FF are shown at the bottom. From the result of Lyax FF, answer seen with the ethanol group showed the highest remained solo at the conversion of 50%. The conversion of 50% means that 50% of the raw materials reacted. The correlation was obtained by comparing the result of IR and EXFF. Thus, this method can be utilized as materials for making decisions if we can buy the raw material or not. The force field in this paper is not good enough, and this version force field is in our recent publication works better. Transition state calculation was conducted to confirm the stability of the vacancy defects estimated from the experimental and calculated PEM. Using the transition state calculation, activation energy to migrate one oxygen atom in the basal frame of the structure was obtained. High activation energy indicates the stable functional groups. As a short summary of detecting defects, a combination of various techniques is essential for analyzing defects in carbon materials. However, our analytical approach requires time and uncertainty in spectral assignments still exist, thus shortening the analysis time and improving the accuracy further at the same time are future challenges. The next is controlling defect in carbon materials. Today I will explain carbon materials with the control 
hydrogenous nitrogen, nitrogen in the base of rain, and zig zag edges. Many methods have been reported for the prediction of nitrogen containing carbon materials, but most of them contain multiple types of nitrogen containing function groups such as pyridinic, amine, and so forth. The, the introduction of one kind of nitrogen containing functional groups is difficult in the absence of catalysts. Especially pyridinic nitrogen and graphitic nitrogen are known to exhibit high performance in various applications. Six of the edge have also been reported to exhibit OR activity, but they are known to be highly reactive and difficult to control. These are the examples of raw materials and preparation methods of carbon materials. As raw materials containing pyrogenic nitrogen, phenanthrin with armature ethis and pyrogenic nitrogen, and anthracene with zigzag edge and pyrogenic nitrogen were used. N1S XPS spectra of sample with pyridinic nitrogen carbonized at 973 Kelvin are shown here. It can be confirmed that the shapes of the spectra differ greatly depending on the position of nitrogen, even if the raw materials have the same ring skeleton and the same number of nitrogen atoms. The percentage of pyrogenic nitrogen in 1,7 financial ring heated at 973 Kelvin is 92%, which is the highest percentage of pyrogenic nitrogen. Those in 1,10 financial ring and phenazine are both 39%, which are the lowest percentage among the samples used in this study. Currently, we have analyzed the detailed reason why these show the lowest and 1.7 show the highest percentage. The next is raw materials containing tertiary nitrogen and quaternary nitrogen. Quaternary nitrogen was challenging to control, thus only tertiary nitrogen will be explained today. N1S XPS spectra or carbon materials prepared at 973 Kelvin from raw materials containing tertiary nitrogen are shown here. The percentage of tertiary nitrogen in indorizinopinorin IQ heated at 973 Kelvin is 98%. Therefore, carbon materials with the selectively introduced tertiary nitrogen in the base of brain could be prepared. Among various edges, the zigzag edges are the most reactive and high reactivity makes them difficult to be controlled. One possible way to control the zigzag edges is to introduce reactive functional group at both ends of anthracene. By using inexpensive anthracene and introducing ethanol and vinyl groups, we aim to we aimed at mass synthesis of carbon materials containing zigzag edges in the absence of catalysts. The ethnyl anthracene and vinyl anthracene and anthracene were used for comparison. The bottom three spectra are experimental spectra and top two spectra are the calculated spectra of IR. It can be seen that the presence of ethanol and vinyl groups lower the carbonization temperature and at 773 Kelvin, the color of those samples became black. On the other hand, anthracene is still not carbonized at 873 Kelvin. At 923 Kelvin, solo in anthracene significantly decreased and DO was formed. For vinyl anthracene at 773 Kelvin, the percentage of DO also increased. However, for the ethanol anthracene, 
the percentage of solo was 100% even after being heated at 773 Kelvin. Therefore, the introduction of the ethnil group were effective to control zigzag edges. This trend was also correlated with the control rate of zigzag edge obtained from the calculation by Reax FF, as I explained. As a result, the carbon material with zigzag edges was successfully prepared. In conclusion, for detecting defects, a large number of computations such as spectra and reaction pathways are essential to reveal defects in carbon materials that cannot be observed under microscopes. For controlling defects, carbon materials containing pyrimic and nitrogen in base of brain and zigzag edges, which were difficult to synthesize in large quantities, can now be prepared by simple method without using catalysts. This work was conducted with the support of many people. I really appreciate everyone's support. Our researchers were supported by these foundations. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. For more detail, visit my website. Thank you very much for your attention. For that uh, presentation, uh, Yasuhiro, it was, uh, it was very interesting. You have, you've done so much work, it's astonishing. And I, I love the way that you summarize the most important papers for us with an asterisk. So we'll now, uh, we're now open for questions. Uh, as I said, we uh, people uh, feel free to type any questions that you would like to ask Professor Yamada in the, in the chat window. Um, so there was a lot of different topics covered there. So I'm sure there are, uh, there are lots of questions out there. All right, everyone seems to be feeling a little bit shy. So uh, I'll ask uh, the first question. Uh, I was very interested in the first uh, topic that you presented on, which was the position of the SP2 and the SP3 peaks. So if, if I understood correctly, you're saying that the, that the SP3 peak is, is not at 285 EV or roughly where everyone would, would normally assign it. How, how has this uh, misassignment happened? Uh, so it's, it's mainly because of the charge up effect. So it's very difficult to remove all the charge up effects from the diamond. So most, uh, as I show the, the figure, mo uh, some of the diamonds are overlapping with each other. And then, um, and sometimes, yeah. So, so th the difficulty of the um, assignment is because of the mainly the charge up effect. If you can remove all the charge up effects, then we, the peak position should be a peak position of the SP3 should be lower than SP2. So uh, actually, the the most people may think that that's um, just normal SP3, but actually, um, most likely it's charged up SP3, or, or maybe because of the presence of heptagon or other um, carbon carbon bonding influenced by the the other defects. Okay, so um, that's remarkable. I've never, I was completely unaware of that. Um, and just uh, revealing my ignorance, can you explain just a little bit what you mean by charge up? What do you mean by charge up? The charge up means reason? that uh, uh, if the material is is less less, uh, it's not conductive, right? If it's not conductive, then the the uh, the X ray X ray hit the sample, and then the electron uh, is removed, and then the sample is is like positively charged. And then uh, if, if the material is conductive, then uh, electron can be um, uh, separated from the, from the sample table, sample table, but the, yeah, yeah. if it's not conductive, it's gonna be uh, positively charged. And then it's hard to uh, recover. Even 
though they use the neutralization, they normally put the uh, electron to neutralize the sample, but the neutralization may be not enough. And it's depending on the uh, uh, how much they neutralize the peak position also shifts. So it's really difficult to analyze uh, that determine the peak position of the sp3. Right. So this is something that's specific to it being uh, very much an insulator uh, as opposed to a conductor. So if you had a material that had a, a high conductivity, then your SP. Right. OK, so this is a that's a very. Yeah, if it's conductive, it's, it should be no problem. But if it's not conductive and it's very difficult to analyze it. OK, so there's some. Uh, there's a whole. The whole series of comments have now appeared in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you can see them. Um, well, I'll, I'll just start from the top. So the first question here is, um, well, uh, thank you for your interesting talk, I agree. Uh, and the, the question is, what information can you gain from IR spectroscopy of carbon that you cannot get from Raman spectroscopy? Yeah. Um... For example, uh, mainly uh, as I explained today, uh, uh, the edge information, like uh, below 1,000 centimeter inverse or like 3, 000, around 3,000, those cannot be obtained by Raman spectroscopy. And also, yeah, currently I'm trying to understand the uh, region from 1,000 to 1,800 centimeter inverse, but uh, yeah, uh, try to understand uh, what's the difference between IR and Raman and yeah, I, I, yeah, I know some something, but still not uh, solidified. So, so maybe I can publish later in the detail. So maybe you can wait until then. We may have to wait for a future <laughs> webinar. Uh, there's another question here, uh, again, about the XPS. Uh, and the question is, uh, regarding the XPS, could the misassignment also be influenced by adsorbed molecules on the carbon surface, uh, the mosaic spread and LALC sizes, uh, for, for if they were graphite, graphite films, or for the graphene, the substrate effect? It's a slightly complicated okay. question, but feel free to read it in the chat if you, it's from PC. Yeah, absorbed molecule also influenced, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure about mosaic mosaic spread, but uh, yeah, yeah, absorbed one is definitely have effect, and uh, also uh, we also calculated the um, absorbed molecule, and uh, it it also shift, and yeah, and there's a yeah, the shift could be up to like zero point five electron volt depending on the structure, but that, yeah. So at soft molecule has also influence. So we have to um, heat, heat the sample before, heat, it, heat up and vacuum the sample before analyzing the sample. Otherwise, maybe the peak position may um, be different, especially the, the at soft water may be um, the uh, big, big issue, you know. Uh, for for example, like infrared, uh, the interaction between the OH group or like pyridine or or other other functional group, then the peak position also shifts. So, yeah, um, preparation of carbon material before analysis is very important. Yeah. So I had another question. Um, so all of your uh, assignment of the peak positions has been done with Gaussian. Uh, how confident are you that Gaussian has uh, the right level of theory for you? And do you have a sense of the, the uncertainties associated with your Gaussian calculations? And, and is there uh, perhaps a higher level of theory to confirm that what you're doing is sufficiently accurate? Yeah, basically, I'm comparing with many, um, many kinds of the reference compounds, uh, aromatic compounds, and, uh, and uh, the Gaussian can um, express the 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 bonding uh, hydrogen bonding as well and uh, uh, maybe I can show you one of the example can I yeah uh, you should be able to share your screen 
Yep. Uh, this is the, uh, can you see this? Yes. But uh, this is the result of uh, the top one is experimental result of the answer thing with uh, carbon acid, right? and uh, the top one is the experimental spectra, and the bottom one, bottom one is calculated one. And uh, I'm sorry, if I calculate just one molecule, right? It's the, if it's just one molecule, then the OH XP spectra becomes. Uh, uh, separated. Mm -hmm. it, the, the bottom one is a calculated one using one molecule of this, this uh, answer in uh, carboxylic acid. But the experimental result, uh, if, if you look at the experimental result, the peak position of OH and CO are very close to each other. But if it's calculated one molecule, it's kind of far. And uh, a further calculation, uh, I'm sorry, it's written in uh, Japanese, but uh, but uh, yeah, so this one, yeah. And if I calculate three molecules with the hydrogen bonding, the, 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 it's gonna be closer. And it, it looks close to the experimental result. So using the um, Gaussian, we can also estimate the uh, degree of the hydrogen bonding. And so not, not only the, uh, just the peak position of just one molecule, but we, we can also, uh, analyze the interaction between the between the molecule as well. So I think it's very um, kind of close, yeah, accurate enough. And I showed you another example at the beginning of the, uh, the seminar, and uh, this one. And as you can see, the uh, the left hand side is calculated, and the right hand side is experimental, and the one as XP spectra. And as you can see, it's very close to each yeah. other. It's so, good. yeah, pretty much, I think it's accurate. It's good uh, enough. enough yeah. I'm just realizing there's two more questions that the questions are starting to pile in, and we maybe we'll take these two questions, and then I think we've hit our one hour limit. Um, so, the next question is a uh, nice presentation. I'm wondering if we can know the type of defect across graphite planes from XPS analysis. Could you say that again? So I am wondering if we can know the type of defect across graphite planes from XPS analysis. Graphite, graphite plane. Uh, yeah, that's um, so. This this paper uh, analyzed the um, graphite. Actually, uh, there are two papers, and uh, one of the paper published in Carbon was up to 1,000 degree, uh, 1, degrees Celsius, and the another one is up to 3,000 uh, degrees Celsius. And uh, yeah, we are uh, using the XPS and other techniques, we uh, try to analyze the, the defects. And uh, most like, yeah, C1S XPS spectra um, usually broaden because of the presence of defects. Uh, although they, uh, it is the polyimide is heated up to 3000 degrees Celsius, we still have um, uh, broadening so compared to the HOPG. So from, from the difference between HOPG and the uh, graphite sample, we can uh, tell the, the roughly, we can roughly tell the percentage of the defect. Yeah, so. Yeah, for example, if it's high, higher, most likely higher compared to the uh, heptagon, it's most likely it's a uh, heptagon related uh, peak. And uh, if it's, if the, we can see like the peak lower than the, uh, the hexagon, it should be related to the pentagon most likely. Okay, so I'll, I'll read out the last question and then we might have to wrap things up. So the final question for tonight, is has the stability of different defects been investigated as a function of storage time or aging defects? If not, can it be? So, so could you say that again? I'm sorry. So, that's all right. Um, so it's the final question in the chat, if you can see it, uh, by okay. CL. 
Um, has the stability of different defects been investigated as a function of storage time or aging effects? If not, oh, can it be? Storage time. Uh, this, maybe if this one can explain the function of stability of the functional group, right? In the, the for example, the nitrile group shown here uh, decreased the peak area. So, and uh, so the nitrile seems to be very reactive. And uh, if, you com if you compare the number F and the G, the peak, peak position are kind of different. So, and I put a question mark here and the, and possibly the nitrile and other like these function T1 like we, we call T1 like this, this position, but this one, this part is also seems like reactive. So yeah, from, from the XPS analysis, we can determine that if, if it's reacted or not. And yeah, and uh, this, the, the bottom one didn't have show the purity when I bought this uh, reference uh, compound and, and the peak position at the peak area is kind of small, so possibly uh, there, there are several reasons, but uh, one of the possibility is um, the purity is not high and other functional group is formed, uh, pro pro probably because of the storage program. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, or, or possibly because of yeah, the presence of the catalyst or possibly, I, I'm not sure, but the, from, uh, yeah, so those information can be seen from, from the experimental and calculated results. So, yeah. Okay, well, I think we might need to wrap things up there. It's been a very impressive presentation and I love how you provided all the references so that people can go back uh, in the quietness of, of time and go through the YouTube video and, and look up all the work that you've done. So thank you, Professor Yamada, for a fascinating and thought-provoking presentation. That was, that was very enjoyable. Okay, so um, uh, normally at this point in our webinar, we would talk about what was happening in a fortnight's time, but uh, that won't happen now because this is our final uh, webinar for 2021. And here in Australia, uh, Christmas is our, our summer break. So uh, we won't be uh, having any presentations uh, over January. We need to have a little bit of a holiday. Um, but before we say goodbye for tonight, um, I do encourage you to spend uh, even five or 10 minutes on the, the GatherTown app. So Jake will be posting the link into the chat for, for GatherTown. It's a nice way to move around in a little virtual world uh, and have a chat one-on-one -on -one or perhaps in a, in a small group. Uh, but of course, if you, have, if you don't have time, then then that's fine as well. So I'm hoping to see, there we go. The link has appeared in the chat. It's there twice, but I'm guessing it's the same link each time. And uh, with that, it's time to uh, bring this particular webinar and the 2021 version to a close. So thanks so much for joining us once again and looking forward to seeing you all in the new year. Good night. Thank you very much.